Okay, now that we've been through univariate statistics, let's proceed with bivariate statistics. We understand the, the univariate properties, the metrics, the normality and skewness and spread and distribution of each of these individual features, but what we're most concerned with is how these features affect some label. And so as we get into bivariate statistics, we're gonna look at three types. And that's what our chapters here are based on. We're gonna look at bivariate, which means two variables, relationships between numeric features and numeric labels. And eventually we'll get to categorical features and numeric labels and then categorical to categorical. So we're gonna continue now with number to number relationships. Now, which relationships are we concerned with? Well, let's take a look at, uh, at these, at this sample data right here. So some terms that I've been using or will continue to use that are a little bit unique to uh, today's data science uh, cultural norms, I guess, is that we refer to each column here as a feature. And uh, column, independent variable, feature, these all mean the same thing. Each row is a case, as we learned before. Now this sample data, they have uh, various data types. And if you're familiar with programming, you're already familiar with these, but whole numbers are integers. Text is a string, or in Python, we call it an object. Uh, uh, decimals mean floats. And so you can see we've got those three main types. Now, one type I don't have in here is a Boolean, a one, zero, or yes, no. So often our categorical features like sex and smoker can be converted to zeros and ones or Boolean objects. But anyway, so we have independent variables and dependent variables. An independent variable is like our feature. The dependent variable is our label. Well, in this particular data set, our label that we've been working with is charges. And the business purpose of this data set is to explain insurance charges with all of these other features. So when we're interested in bivariate relationships, we're not interested in the relationship between age and sex or BMI and children. We're interested in each feature with the label charges. So that helps us scope down uh, what analyses we're interested in. So in this case, charges is a float or it's numeric, and then we have three other numeric features. So the extent of our numeric to numeric relationships will be in these three relationships, age to charges, BMI to charges, and children to charges. We're gonna save sex, smoker, and region for a couple of chapters later when we look at categorical features. All right, so how do we characterize this relationship? I'm gonna use the term effect size. Uh, we can call it a relationship, uh, I like to use this term because it implies that each feature has an effect on the label. Now, as we learned at the very beginning of this book, this doesn't mean the effect is a causal effect or a causal relationship, but we're going to imply it as long as we have a good theoretical explanation for why that feature could cause those charges. So for example, the older we get, the more health problems we have, the more health declines, which naturally leads to greater charges. So even though we're not running an experiment to prove that age leads to greater age leads to greater charges, we're going to imply it because we have a good theoretical explanation for it. BMI, people who are larger, um, BMI has kind of fallen out of favor these days with uh, uh, body fat percentage usually being a better metric because you can have someone who's pretty strong and heavy and he'll have a high BMI score but a much lower body fat score. But it could, be a, it could be argued, though, that our heart doesn't care if our weight is muscle or fat. It's going to struggle if we're heavy either way. So in that case, we'll say that BMI has a theoretical effect on charges. Children, this doesn't mean uh, the cost of children's charges. This is referring still to just the adult's charges. But you could say, well, children, it could go either way. More kids could be more happiness or more kids could be more of a pain. No, we don't say that, right? It, it, uh, there's a variety of reasons why children could lead to more or less charges. So maybe we don't have as strong of a theory there, but we're going to explore that relationship. So effect size is another term for the relationship or the effect of a feature on a label. All right. So here's a summary of our various relationship or effect size types. And we have a different measure of effect size for each type of relationship. If the label's numeric and the feature is numeric, we're going to learn and use Pearson correlation as well as R squared. The visual, primary visualization we'll use is a scatter plot. And so you can see here as we go through to the chapters, there's a, a different effect size statistic and a different visual, uh, default visualization for each one of these relationship comparisons. All right, so effect size for a number to number relationship. Uh, the Pearson correlation is the most common and it assumes um, that the feature and the label that we're comparing are both normally distributed. 
If you remember from the univariate stats chapter, that means that the histogram follows a bell-shaped curve or Gaussian curve. And it's calculated uh, with this formula. Now, in this class, this is not a stats class. I'm not going to require you to go through and memorize formulas or hand perform mathematical formulas uh, on paper and pencil. The concept is what you need to understand. And this is basically the difference between the actual value and the mean value of both the x-coordinate, which is the feature, and the y-coordinate, the label. And we sum up those differences. And then uh, we divide that by the square root of the squared differences for both the feature and the label between the actual value and the, and the, and the mean. So essentially, this tells us how much these two concepts overlap. And uh, a diagram I like to use to understand that. All right, here it is. So these three circles, or these three pairs of circles, represent the correlation between the label charges and the feature age, and then BMI and children. So the larger the crossover, the more that as age moves, charge moves as well. In other words, as people get older, they end up costing more money. And that's represented by this 29.9% overlap here. The slightly lower correlation here between charges and BMI is represented by a slightly smaller overlap, and then again, a smaller one between children and charges. But essentially means that, again, as one feature moves, for example, as BMI gets higher or lower, charges also gets higher or lower. However, correlation doesn't care, or it handles, I should say, whether this relationship is positive or negative. Let's get to that in a second. So here's our, our formula once again. And down here, we have scatter plots representing various correlations between pairs of numeric variables. The scatter plot's the perfect way to represent the relationship between two numeric features. In this case, we have a perfect correlation, one. And the actual angle doesn't matter uh, as much as it matter as much as the position of these plotted points. So in this case, we can draw a perfect straight line through all plotted points, uh, and this line perfectly it's it's completely predictable. As x moves a certain unit, y always moves in the exact same unit each time. And thus, we can predict using the y equals mx plus b formula that you learned back in high school. Uh, we can predict every label by the exact value of the x. Now, this rarely happens in practice unless we're looking at two variables compared, one variable compared to itself, like age compared to birth year or something like that. But uh, it illustrates this point of a positive correlation. And now here's our negative correlation, meaning that as, as x increases, y decreases. So a correlation can range from negative 1 to 1. Uh, and actually, look, I've got a typo here. That should be a, a 1, not a negative 1. But my point here is that this angle, it's not as steep as this one, but they're both a correlation of 1. So that's uh, uh, the actual angle of the slope is not represented by the correlation. That's what's represented by the y equals mx plus b formula that illustrates uh, the actual slope of these lines. But the correlation, again, as it gets closer to zero, that means the dots will be further and further spread out. So, for example, down here, the dots are more spread out around the line. This line doesn't perfectly cross over every dot, but there's a very clear trend of these dots. It's fairly predictable, and so our correlation is still very high, or in this case, very low, or meaning close to 1 or negative 1. Down here, they get more spread out still, and you see the correlation continues to go down. But surprisingly, I mean, if you didn't have that line right there and just looked at these dots, it would look like there's not a whole lot of trend. But that's a pretty large correlation, actually. So uh, it's tough to just look at a scatter plot uh, and really be able to estimate what that correlation is without calculating it. So again, correlation is our measure of effect size. And what is a large or small correlation? Well, there's a variety of... Uh, Answers to that question, it depends on which research paper you ask. Uh, generally speaking, they'll call 10 to 0.29 a small effect size, and then up to 0.5 medium and up to uh, above 0.5 large. But truthfully, uh, we're pretty happy with a, an effect size of 0.10. That's, that's enough to uh, make a difference in a good um, predictive model that we'll learn later on. This tool is kind of nice, um, not necessary, but it's a nice visual of exactly um, what's going on here. So uh, take this line right here, and as you drag it closer together, this changes the how much those circles cross over and how close the dots are. And you can see the correlation change from 0 to 1 and then past 0 to negative 1, illustrating the point of how these relationships are characterized by a correlation.
However, the correlation uh, coefficient r alone isn't enough. We also need this y equals mx plus b formula to help us understand the exact uh, placement of this regression line or this line of best fit here. Anyway, kind of a nice tool, thanks to uh, rpsychologist.com. Okay, so we, know, we get the idea of a correlation. However, it's important to understand there are some assumptions about uh, correlations that need to hold true to really trust that correlation coefficient. For example, we need to have continuous data. So right here we have interval uh, data. And in other words, values in between these dots are not valid. As a result, it makes it really tough to come up with a valid line of regression because uh, these values in between the dots aren't valid. So we're drawing a line through values that can't really occur in practice. For example, maybe we're looking at, um, uh, we also call this, well, uh, it could be like uh, election results, what rank they finish in and count of the number of votes they got or something. You can't get one and a half votes. Uh, you can only get whole votes, something like that. The next assumption, um, now, if, if this doesn't hold true, this doesn't mean we can't calculate a correlation. We can still calculate one. It just means that we have to interpret things properly. So if we uh, have a four and it projects, uh, that's probably a bad one. Maybe our line projects, uh, you know, uh, five and a half. We have to round that up to six or back down to five. We have to interpret it properly. So even if it's not, if it's, if it's not continuous, if there's more and more values, the scatter plot will look more and more like a continuous scatter plot. But since there's only so few values, you see these really stark gaps here. The other problem with uh, non-continuous data is it hides dots. How many cases are truly represented here in this graph? For example, right here at 2 comma 6, uh, we see one dot, but there could be 500 cases at that value, and they're all on top of each other, and we just don't see them. So again, that's the danger of uh, Con, of uh, non-continuous data, but it's not one that prevents us from, uh, we, we can still calculate a correlation. The next one is linear relationship. So a linear relationship means that there's a linear trend to the dots. And you can see here, this is an example of where the trend is not linear. There's two inflection points. And what that means is a straight line doesn't represent it very well, which means that we have different types of error at different places along the x value. If we drew a straight line here, then from 0 to 3, the error is going to be mostly on the lower side. And then from about 2 to 6, the error is going to be on the upper side and so forth. So it's not a consistent uh, x-y relationship. But again, we have ways of getting around that. We can, uh, as you'll learn later in the course, we can come up with ways of making the line not straight. And we can account for these inflection points. So uh, here's another example of that. Lastly. Uh, this assumption of a homoscedastic relationship. So that means that the spread or the error around the regression line uh, is the same across all values of x. And here's a couple of examples where that's clearly not true. It fans out at the beginning of the end or towards the end. That just means that uh, we're going to get a correlation value that's sort of the average of all these. That's something like this area right here. But that means if we're making predictions in the 0 to 300 range, we're going to have a lot less error than we do if we make predictions from the 300 to 600 range. We'll have much more error out here. So it just means that when we make predictions, we're going to have to be aware that depending on our input value of x, the likelihood that our projected value of y is accurate depends on what range we are in in the x. So we have to be aware of that. And there's also some things we can do to try to reduce heteroscedasticity that you'll learn later on in the book when you learn about uh, correcting skewness and things like that. So how do we fix these? Well, uh, we can still calculate correlations and let's say we're not able to fix um, uh, these, these, uh, these issues. There are other types of measures that we can use. For example, Kendall's tau and Spearman's uh, uh, are, Spearman, the Sp Kendall's correlation and Spearman's correlation are both more preferred measures when these assumptions don't hold true. So again, it's not that we can't calculate a correlation at all, but you might write in your code to simply check and see if skewness is greater than one or less than negative one. And if so, then use Kendall's tau or Spearman's correlation instead of Pearson correlation. It's pretty, uh, pretty simple to do. Lastly, okay, we've learned about the correlation uh, 
um, coefficient and we've learned about the assumptions that need to be held true to trust a correlation coefficient, let's learn about p-values. So the p-value is the probability, come on here, it's the probability that the correlation and that r equals mx plus, uh, sorry, the y equals mx plus b formula, it's the probability that those results we found are not going to be repeated the next time we collect data, or the likelihood that what we saw is not truly representative of the overall population. So a low p-value means that the correlation we found, for example, 2.99, a low p-value means that it's very likely that we'll see a 0.299 correlation the next time we collect 1,000 samples, or 1,300, or however many is in that data set. So we like low p-values because it simply means we can trust the results that we got. Okay, that's the concept, the concepts here of numeric to numeric features. If you'd like, go ahead and take this reading quiz just to see if you understand it. Um, it may or may not be counted for points depending on your instructor. And then we'll proceed uh, with 15.5 and start doing these things in Python after that.